Thank you so much, Julie. And it's really exciting to be here today. I'm one of those people that still gets excited post COVID about having the opportunity to talk uh, in, in a room to a live audience like this. It's really wonderful. So as Julie said, my name is Dr. Sophie Lloyd Wilson. I'm a historian of Chinese Australian history here at the University of Sydney. And I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded lands of the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my own respects to elders past, present and emerging. So today I'm going to talk to you about something quite close to my heart, and that is Sydney's Chinese history, what I've called Sydney's Chinese ghosts. And especially this document up here. This is the 1891 report of the New South Wales Royal Commission on alleged Chinese gambling and immorality and charges of bribery against members of the police force. So before I even get into it, I would love to draw your attention to this quite startling title. And I'd like to kind of point out how, how unprecedented this Royal Commission was, not only in Sydney in 1891, but actually across the British Empire. It's the only Royal Commission of its kind into the immorality of a migrant community. So think about that. It's not simply looking into Chinese gambling or charges of bribery against members of the police force, something I think we're quite well acquainted with in New South Wales. Um, it's actually looking into immorality as well, which is a kind of deeply subjective idea. So it's, it's an unprecedented document. This quite remarkable document, 272 pages of it, was printed by the New South Wales government printer in 1892. And a copy of it has you know, really serendipitously made its way into the marvelous rare books collection here at the University of Sydney and has recently very kindly and generously been digitized by staff here. So we're very, very lucky to have it. I'll explain why in a minute. Before I get into the kind of bones of the document, I wanna give you a little bit of background into the history of Chinese migration uh, to Sydney. Okay. When we think of the Chinese in Sydney, I think all of us will probably think immediately of Haymarket, of what today we call Sydney's Chinatown, uh, with its Chinese archways and ubiquitous Chinese restaurants. But actually, Sydney's Chinese heritage can be found in other parts of the city as well. For example, Sydney's first Chinatown was not the one we know today. It was in the rocks. And the Chinatown that's the focus of this inquiry is actually the Chinatown that was in the rocks in Sydney. This was known as Sydney's main Chinatown right up until the 1920s. Another smaller old city Chinatown existed here in Waterloo near Alexandria in Sydney. And this was the Chinatown most closely associated with Ch Sydney's Chinese market gardeners that grew so much of the fruit and vegetables that this city depended upon before refrigeration. Um, so this community in Waterloo and Alexandria, you know, now where the airport is, um, was absolutely fundamental to the economy and the survival of the Sydney community via fruit and vegetables. And the market gardeners in this area built this beautiful temple, which is still there, the Yoming Temple or the Retreats Retreat Street Temple in Sydney. Um, so Alexandria and Waterloo are very, very important, yet often kind of a forgotten part of Sydney's Chinese heritage. And it's interesting, this, this temple sort of like was quite obvious at the time. And it was said that if you walk down what's called Retreat Street in Alexandria in say the 1880s and 1890s, so our time period, you could be in Hong Kong or Shanghai. So it was full of kind of Chinese shops, you know, the sounds of Chinese music, Chinese food, etc. Um, and this beautiful, beautiful temple. These days it's kind of hidden behind a million apartment blocks, which is very Sydney, but it's still there, which is, which is wonderful. Um, so Sydney's Chinese heritage is evidenced in other ways as well, in the very names of our cities. So in fact, the City of Sydney Council has recently been trying to acknowledge the heritage of Chinese market gardeners in the area of Alexandria and Waterloo, and has actually named some streets after Chinese market gardeners. So we have Sam Singh Street here, which is, you know, a quiet, but I think a positive development in terms of beginning to acknowledge Sydney's Chinese ghosts, which, you know, so fundamental to the city's history. So really, Chinese Sydney is all around us in ways I don't think we're necessarily aware of in the back streets and the street names of our city. What I want to do today, briefly, is give you a sort of quick potted history of Sydney's Chinese past from the 1850s to the 1900s, and then I'm gonna dive into the Royal Commission and we can really kind of analyze 
analyze that. I'm going to be focusing a lot on the years of 1891 to 1892 eventually. Um, these were very, very important years in Sydney's Chinese history. And of course, they're the years that relate to our Royal Commission. Important to kind of acknowledge that this Royal Commission was motivated by a, a really kind of confronting xenophobic wave that began in Australia and particularly in New South Wales in around 1888 against Chinese migration. So the period we're looking at is kind of the peak of this xenophobic wave against Chinese migration that really begins in, in 1888. So just important background um, for this. Okay, so it's important to remember that um, unlike uh, many of the European migrants to Sydney, Chinese migrants in Sydney have left us very few written clues to piece together their emotional life and history. When it comes to early Sydney's Chinatowns, however, we have been lucky for, for two reasons. There are two groups of sources that we can look to to really piece together early Chinese life in the city. The first is archaeological evidence. So in the 1990s, as you may be aware of, there was a kind of wonderful renaissance in Sydney archaeological work and history. And there was a big dig in the rocks behind a kind of famous old Chinese boarding house led by a historian called Jane Lydon, who wrote a wonderful book about it called Many Inventions, which I highly recommend. So she dug behind what was an old Chinese boarding house in the rocks. And because of her work and the work of her team, we have a lot of archaeological evidence telling us quite a lot about, say, the diet of these men, the leisure activities of these men. And one of the things that emerged from her dig was a lot about gambling and kind of the role of gambling and the role of certain kinds of, of games in terms of the leisure activities and social sociability of the men that lived in early Chinatown, say from the 1850s onwards in Sydney. Okay. So the other bit of evidence that we have <laughs> to document the lives of Chinese migrants, apart from the archeological evidence, which I'll talk about in a minute, is of course the Royal Commission. So when it comes to piecing together the lives of the men and women that came to Australia from China, I would argue that New South Wales has an embarrassment of riches in terms of these two groups of evidence, the archeological evidence and the Royal Commission. And I'll talk about how they speak to each other in a minute. So the link between Sydney and China was forged from the earliest years of the colony of New South Wales, when convict ships returned to Britain via Hong Kong to take on cargoes of tea. Some of the very first Chinese migrants in Sydney were crew members working on these shipping lines who jumped ship when they arrived in Sydney. By the mid 19th century, Sydney had become the fourth largest seaport in the British, em British Empire. Its commercial and geographical status having been enhanced by increasing trade with China in the Pacific. But as many of you know, it's really the discoveries in the gold rushes that bring you know, the really large populations of Chinese migrants to Australia. In the early years of the gold rush, New South Wales and Victoria were gold mining centres and attracted thousands of hopeful diggers. In total, 22 million migrants, a very large number, departed uh, South China after 1840 to take part in the global gold rushes. So 22 million Chinese migrants leave from South China to go to Australia, the United States, Canada, South Africa and across the Pacific. And the historian Adam McEwen always reminds us that this is one of the biggest migrations in world history. It's not thought of on par as um, with the migration, say, from Europe to America at the same time, from, say, Ireland or Eastern Europe to the Americas, but actually the numbers are quite similar in terms of the scale of migration from South China. This is important because Sydney becomes a real hub um, for you know, the, traffic, the, the traffic of these gold miners you know, into New South Wales and into Victoria. For example, on April 10th, 1881, over 600 Chinese passengers from Hong Kong arrived in Sydney. In that month alone, over 2,000 Chinese migrants came to Australia by way of Sydney. And between 1878 and 1888, 810 Chinese migrants arrived in Australia. So considering that the population of Sydney was only around 220,000 at this time, this is quite a significant population of people and they're all kind of coming through the rocks to places like this in Gulgong in the gold field. So through the rocks, Chinatown, is that, that's where um, Chinese migrants are going through. Okay, so where do they come from? What's quite interesting about the history of 
Cantonese migration at this time is that the vast majority of migrants, you know, kind of a, to all the gold field locations across the world come from a relatively small part of China. So this part of South China here around the Pearl River Delta, you know, that's what, what's known today as Guangdong, the province of Guangdong. Okay, it's sort of, you can see these provinces around Hong Kong. It's quite, it's a relatively small area, but very highly populated and very densely populated with people. Um, important to realise that this is kind of quite a medieval part of China in that there's a lot of tension between different migrant groups in these different areas. So Taishan, Kaiping, Zhongshan area. So the vast majority of Sydney Chinese today have some links to Zhongshan area, whereas a lot of American migrants in California are more associated with the Taishan area. And these are quite small kind of parts of of, of South China. So very, very large populations from quite a small part um, of China. So what do we know about the lives of these people? Well, we know that their loyalties to the villages that they came from were maintained once they got to Sydney. To kind of illustrate a little bit about how intense village loyalties were for many Cantonese migrants in Penang, which was um, you know, another uh, site for Cantonese migration at the time, um, there was so much animosity between uh, migrants from different villages that they landed at different jetties. The government literally organised for them to land at different jetties so they didn't fight with each other. It's important to kind of realise that this is not a homogenous group of people. There's a lot of kind of history being imported as they come um, into, into their new um, host nation, host communities. All right, so let's get into the rocks. This is the rocks in Sydney in 1885. And this is where um, the Chinatown was um, at the time. So I wanna talk a little bit about the archeological evidence that draws us into the lives of these Chinese migrants. So when Jane Lydon did her dig in the rocks in the 1990s, she dug behind the shop of Hong On Zhang, who was a kind of famous merchant in Sydney. And you would go to his, um, his boarding house if you were from the Zhongshan region of, of um, South China. And that was your first place you would stop if you were a Chinese migrant arriving in Sydney. So Leiden found some interesting items behind the shop. The main waste was fish bones, indicating that, that fish, especially snapper, was the main part of um, the Chinese diet. There are also many bottles of Chinese alcohol, which supports evidence from the Royal Commission stating that Chinese drinking games were really popular in the boarding house. Leiden also found lots of ginger pots and high quality Chinese cooking items. She used this evidence to show the care that was um, awarded to food preparation in the boarding house. And she sort of implied that the preparing and sharing of food and drink was really key um, for the men in the boarding house, kind of maintaining their community ties and cultural links with, with each other. Okay. So now that we've looked a little bit at the archeological evidence, I wanna talk a little bit about another aspect of the archive of Chinese Sydney and Sydney's Chinese ghosts. And that is the vast archive of European perceptions of Chinese migrants. What I, would, what I tend to term the surveillance archive. So the reason I term this archive the surveillance archive is out of all the migrant populations to Sydney at this time, migrants from, you know, who spoke Scots Gaelic from Scotland, from Ireland, of all the migrants to Sydney at this time, the community that got the most surveillance from the government was the Chinese community. So we have a huge archive of, say, photographs of um, the community, the Sydney Chinese community in the rocks. These are photographs taken during the so-called plague resumption period. There was a fear that there was um, outbreaks of plague in the rocks and so photogra photographers went in to photograph the area because it was going to be demolished. And in doing so, they captured some um, really interesting faces. This is a Chinese woman and her baby seen here um, with a community and I think this is probably her partner um, in the rocks. So this archive is massive and it's, 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 a, it's a really useful archive, the surveillance archive in terms of telling us a little bit about uh, Sydney's Chinese community. However, we've got to use it with care because it also tells us a, bit, a lot more, I think, about European perceptions than maybe Chinese perspectives. So my challenge as a historian has always been, how do I get beyond the European perceptions and fears and racisms around Chinese migrants to the actual lives of Chinese migrants themselves? And I'll talk about that in a, in a sec with the, the Royal Commission. So, by the 1880s, 
European perceptions of Chinatown and the Rocks were gradually more and more negative. European journalists regularly represented the area as kind of an exotic slum, as picturesque and dirty and dangerous. So a lot of talk of disease, a lot of talk of corruption, and always implied immorality. So here's a quote from the Illustrated Sydney News, Sydney News from 1888. The gravest charge against our Chinese population is that they are physically and morally unwholesome neighbours. So that's 1888. At the same time, as European perceptions of Chinatown in the rocks were growing steadily more negative, a big class divide was opening up within the Chinese community itself between richer, affluent and often quite assimilated Chinese merchants and kind of working class Chinese market gardeners um, and hawkers. Okay. I'm um, just going to skip forward a little bit. So these, these photographs, I'd highly recommend these, by the way, they're wonderful photographs to kind of accompany your read of the Royal Commission because they really, they probably capture some of the people that are interviewed in, in the commission. Okay, here we have the boarding house that um, Jane Lydon did the archaeological dig on. We have it here. Okay, all right. And here we have a kind of classic depiction of a Chinese uh, hawker in the rocks in 1888. Okay. All right. This is a wonderful text, by the way, again, to read with the Royal Commission. This is a um, Chinese and English self-educator, and it was often used by Chinese market gardeners who were trying to communicate with their Chinese audience. So you can see here kind of some of the phrases that Chinese hawkers might have used. She has not paid me yet. Are you afraid that I may run away? Oh no, not at all. So you can see the kinds of interactions that may have occurred between customers and um, Chinese market gardeners, hawkers. And if, if those of you interested in kind of history of feminism and gender may have picked up a little bit from this talk, you know, you'll pick it up more from the commission, that there is a lot here documenting interactions between European women and Chinese men. And one of the great anxieties that emerges in 1888 is the number of mixed race marriages between European, mostly Irish women and Chinese men that, you know, become part of the Sydney Rocks community. And a, a number of those Irish women are actually interviewed and you can read their testimony about being married to Chinese men in this document. It's a really incredible um, opportunity to think about early mixed race marriages in the city via um, the Royal Commission. Okay, I'm just going to move on now. Can we... All right, so here we have an example of some of the anxieties that motivate the Royal Commission. Okay, so by the 1880s and 1890s, there's this absolute fascination with kind of um, a kind of exotic, you know, orientalized Sydney Chinatown. And one of the big focuses is this notion that European women are going into opium dens in Chinatown and taking opium and kind of living with Chinese men. And here you have kind of this European policemen kind of shining a light on this terrible immorality that's happening, you know, supposedly happening um, in, in, in Chinatown. So the reason I've got this photograph up here is as this is all happening and these European perceptions are getting more and more negative, there are some really influential Chinese merchants emerging in the community. You may have, may have heard of Kuang Tart, I'll talk about him in a second. And they are emerging as kind of um, men and women who speak very good English, they're often Christian, they're highly educated. And in order to protect themselves from European racism, they begin criticising the working class members of their community. So when they hear charges of immorality against their community, they say, well, yes, but it's only the working class members of our community that do this. So one of their ways of deflecting criticism is by kind of blaming the market gardening community, which, which, which that the market gardeners deeply, deeply resent. And that's also a theme you can pick up in the Royal Commission. Okay, here's another kind of image of accusations of kind of Chinese immorality, okay? Um, so you can see here gambling happening alongside an image of you know, Chinese men talking to European women. So this is kind of the moral panic that's emerging in terms of European perceptions. And you can see here a picture of um, members of what's, what's called the Gaoya community in Waterloo in Alexandria in Sydney. These are kind of working class Chinese men playing instruments. And these are kind of upper class Chinese Australian women adopting kind of European dress. So these divides are emerging right about the time of our Royal Commission. Okay, and here we have Kuang Tart. All right, so Kuang Tart is a member of um, uh, Sydney's elite. 
Uh, he runs the Kuang Cha Tea Rooms in the QBB building in Sydney. He can recite Scottish poetry, he's married to a Scottish woman, and he is one of the commissioners on the Royal Commission. So what's so interesting about this Royal Commission into Chinese Gambling Immorality is one of the commissioners is actually Chinese, which is often forgotten um, in, in, in analysis of the Royal Commission. Yes, he was Chinese, but in fact, for many members of, say, the working class community in Alexandria and Waterloo, he was a little bit of a class enemy because he was someone that was seen as being, you know, kind of too assimilated to European society, too willing to please the Europeans. So there's this kind of tension emerging between Chinese merchants who are very much kind of in with the Europeans and kind of working class, you know, Chinese as well. So Kuang Tart had come to Australia with his uncle when he was nine years old and had worked with a Scottish family in Braidwood in um, just south of Sydney. And there he had kind of picked up like not only Scots Gaelic, but an actual Scottish accent in his English. So this was a Chinese man who spoke with a Scottish accent, okay? So it's a really kind of fascinating insight into the kind of the characters that populated 19th century Sydney. Um, so as I said, he was invited to be on the Royal Commission. And here we have Kuang Tart in 1885 outside his famous tea rooms in the QVB. And if you're interested in, in his tea rooms, the Powerhouse has a wonderful collection, Powerhouse Museum, of items from his tea rooms. Quite interesting if you wanted to look at that. Okay, here we have more images. This is Kuang Tart and his wonderful Scottish wife. She was, you know, a really colourful character herself. And they lived in Ashfield, where, where I live today. And you can actually visit, you know, their house in Ashfield where they lived. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. So here we have... Um, the concerns about gambling that I'm going to bring us to now. Okay, so by the 1880s, uh, if you walk into the rocks in Sydney, if you walk down retreats through Alexandria, you're probably going to hear the sounds of two kinds of Chinese uh, gambling games. Okay, one of those is so-called pakapu, um, and one of those is fantan. Uh, two different games. One's a lottery game, uh, and one's a game of chance um, in which you you push. Um, your number, you know, in certain squares um, of a grid, and depending on where um, uh, the dice dice falls, you, you receive winnings of, on that. Okay, so there's two kinds of games, and the Sydney Press, sorry for the bad quality of this reproduction, begins really focusing on this gambling, and one of their their focuses is this idea that working class um, European men and European women are spending their hard won wages in these Chinese gambling dens. So at a time in Sydney in the 1880s and 1890s where, you know, the depression was a terrible depression in Australia at this time, uh, big economic downturn um, had hit. There's no real welfare at this time. There's no welfare state in Australia yet that comes later. At a time of kind of real visible poverty in um, Sydney's urban streetscape, the press be begins linking this poverty to gambling and to Chinese immorality. So the notion is if we can stamp out Chinese gambling, we will somehow address this poverty. And I think you can see here continuities with the ways in which migrant communities are often blamed for the social ills of a society that, that are really to do with capitalism and to do with government mismanagement often get blamed on a migrant community. And this is the case um, here, definitely. Okay. So here we have um, a classic raid um, what begins happening is um, the police increasingly and quite visibly by the 1880s and 1890s begin these raids on so-called, you know, Chinese gambling dens in Sydney. Um, and here's a raid from 1872. And they're kind of reported in the press with a lot of um, aplomb. And you can kind of pick up the kind of really confronting racist themes that are emerging. In the middle of all this, uh, in Sydney, an anti-Chinese gambling league forms um, in the late 1880s and in kind of 1891. Okay, so it's July 1891 when this, this anti-Chinese gambling league, which is a group of businessmen, meet in Sydney in a hotel and they demand a royal commission into Chinese gambling and immorality. And they also want a royal commission into accusations that the police force are being bribed by Chinese migrants to continue the gambling. So these are the kind of two big accusations. Now, this is a quite a small group of um, businessmen. I think it's about 10 or 11 that form the Anti-Chinese Gambling League. But they have the ear of a man called Henry Parks, who is the premier at the time. And it's Henry Parks that calls the royal commission into Chinese gambling and morality. And so this, the Royal Commission then commences its work in, in 1891. Okay. 
All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the Royal Commission and get into some of the quotes from it, then you can ask me some questions about it. The reason I've got this photograph up here is, again, I want to remind us that this Royal Commission is very much about commencing intensive surveillance on the Chinese community in Sydney in a way that I think shows links to the surveillance that is carried out under the White Australia policy, right? So, you know, it creates a huge archive of kind of watching this community. But there's an element of this particular commission that's very unusual in the surveillance archive and very unique in that eventually what the commission decides is that the charges of, gam of um, immorality against the Chinese community are unfounded and the charges of bribery against the police force are un unfounded. So the commission finds against Henry Parks. It finds against the anti-Chinese gambling league. And that is really interesting at a time where we really associate the 1890s with a really terrible kind of um, racism, um, xenophobic nationalist racism, the commission actually finds against all these charges. It says the evidence is woefully uncertain uh, to make these claims. So I think that's a kind of really, really interesting, um, interesting moment. And in fact, if you later if you have time, I'd really urge you to have a look at the report. In the, the front of the um, Royal Commission is a report into all of their evidence. There are 271 pages of evidence. And they find that um, the charges against the Chinese broke down generally under the examination of, of witnesses. Um, one way and another, the charges of bribery broke down and your commissioners were unanimously agreed before the case against the police was concluded that the Royal Commission was erroneously called. So it's really amazing that these commissioners come together and actually imply criticism of Henry Parks and criticism of the government in spending all that money on this Royal Commission. So it's actually quite a radical moment, I think, in Australian history. And you're not going to get that if you just look at the title. Right, which is very, I think, kind of confronting to us today. But if you look at the content, you see there's a really interesting corrective happening saying, you know, we sh you should not have gone with the sensationalist press reporting. You should not have gone with the sensationalist um, politics. If you actually dig deep into this community, you find something very, very different. OK, so I'd really encourage you um, to read to read this report a little bit. OK, um, I'll give you just a couple of examples now, you know, from from the commission. Um, the report says there are four distinct charges against the Chinese for immorality. For example, it was stated that after the appointment of the commission, uh, one of the police officers involved um, in working the rocks uh, went to the cabinet maker Artoy, who was a famous cabinet maker in the rocks, and asked for a receipt for a bookcase. A lot was made of this in the press. This guy, this idea that the police, this, this police officer went to Artoy and asked for a receipt. So the idea was that Artoy had given him a bookcase at one point to bribe him to turn his, um, his, his attention away from gambling. It was shown that in fact, um, uh, the bookshelf had been paid for in full. It was simply that a receipt had never been written out. So again and again, rumours of kind of corruption and rumours of bribery are undermined when the commission digs down into the evidence. Another accusation against a police officer uh, was that he'd asked uh, Chinese migrants to smuggle tobacco in for him off ships. It turns out that in fact, um, the tobacco was simply given to him as a gift by one of his friends who was a Chinese seaman in the rocks. So instead of these kinds of nefarious connections emerging that imply corruption in the police force, these kinds of everyday social relationships begin emerging between Europeans and Chinese migrants in the rocks that are relatively benevolent and in fact quite interesting. So this is to me the greatest takeaway of the Royal Commission. Not that um, it confirmed or illustrated the kind of sensationalist fears of the press, but rather that it completely undercut them and really portrayed a very ordinary, interesting, multicultural community on Sydney shores um, in the 1890s. So I might leave it there, Julie, <laughs> and open up for questions. I've got a lot more to say, but thank you guys so much. <laughs> Hello, hi. Oh, that was great. Thanks. I've learned so much. Um, can I ask, at the beginning, you mentioned that uh, something about the report, um, it being unusual that we had it, or being 
quite rare or lucky to get hold of. So they didn't print many. So, you know, Royal Commissions are to this day so expensive prohibitively expensive, right? And back then they were even more expensive. So printing that particular book was very pricey. Um, there's constant complaints about, you know, how expensive it is to, to print things with a government printer. So not many copies exist of this. Also, I think there was a period in Australian history um, where, you know, this is quite an embarrassing document. Um, and, you know, there's rumours that a number of copies were destroyed or it just wasn't assigned much value as a document. It's a very unusual Royal Commission. It wasn't seen as being particularly intellectual or worthwhile to keep. Um, and so we know for a fact that in some private collections that they were simply thrown out. So for us to have this document literally here is quite unusual for us to be able to go through. And you can see it's actually a very long document with lots of um, evidence from everyday people, people that would not have um, uh, written down their thoughts otherwise. You know, a lot of the Irish women that are interviewed, for example, and some of the Scottish women didn't even speak English. They spoke Scots Gaelic as a first language, for example. They spoke Irish, right? And so when they're interviewed, you know, they often, you know, they say, my first language is not English. Um, and so for us to have them on record speaking about their lives, living with Chinese men, for example, is really rare. So it's rare on two fronts, I think, <laughs> to answer your question. Hi. Two quick questions. How many commissioners were there? Yep. And what was Henry Parks' reaction? Oh, that's a great question. There were five. There were five commissioners. Let me bring it up here. Um, here we go. Um, here we go. So yes, there's five commissioners. Um, it was led by a guy called Patrick Manning, William Patrick Manning, who was the mayor of the city of Sydney. There was Francis Abigail, Ramsay MacKillop, Kwong Tart, and John Stuart Hawthorne. Okay, so there's five commissioners. Parks was furious. <laughs> this is not, not what was meant to happen, uh, you know. And I think also um, he's, he's kind of furious because the commission was very thorough and very scientific in its approach. They wanted to make sure they were beyond reproach. So every bit of evidence or every bit of rumour um, that was you know, passed on to them about Chinese immorality, about opium smoking, about gambling, um, you know, about police corruption, they did put to the test thoroughly. In fact, they say, you know, often, you know, we, 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 we swung too far towards giving those rumours credibility, but every single time the rumours fell down on cross-examination of witnesses. So Parks was incensed. This is not what he, he had wanted to produce a document that would help him justify the anti-Chinese immigration laws that he'd introduced in 1888, okay? Instead, he got a document all about kind of, you know, inter-community, ethnic harmony and happiness, which is not what he wanted. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question a bit. Yeah. So did you got one? Yeah. Um, after this Royal Commission, did it help, was there a kind of a backswing in the, the xenophobic um, media and reporting? Did it go back the other way? Or That's a great question, Julie, and in fact would be a wonderful topic for an honours thesis or a PhD thesis for us to do that. There's not been enough investigation into that. Um, you know, my sense um, was that, unfortunately, no. Uh, the press went a bit quiet. And now the reason, the reason no, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this, is in fact in 1892, after the, um, uh, you know, after the, um, Commission report is released, there's actually a big riot in Retreat Street in Waterloo between two sections of the Chinese community. So in fact, um, uh, members of the kind of Chinese merchant community who were based in Haymarket and, you know, um, the Gao Ya community or the Market Garden community in Alexandria, um, divides between this community had been so incensed by the Royal Commission, you know, a sense that, you know, that the more uh, kind of wealthy merchants were speaking down to these market gardeners. And again, the press exacerbated these tensions, led to this big riot. And the press reported on that as Chinese secret societies clash, you know, right? Whereas actually it was about politics. It was about kind of a more kind of right-wing merchant community and then a working class community feeling like they were being patronized by that community. That's quite interesting. Um, just quickly, I realized I wanted to kind of show you guys something. There's another thing that happens that speaks to this issue. Um, so here you can see kind of three, what I would say are the three pillars of the surveillance archive together. These are the successive um, anti-Chinese immigration laws that become the White Australia policy in 1901. There's also a series of factor acts beginning in 1873 in Victoria and New South Wales and then everything culminates with the Royal Commission. So the factor acts are really important and speak to Julie's question. These are, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of labour laws that are introduced 
You can see this one's in 1897. And they focus a lot on kind of Chinese working conditions. So, you know, right up until kind of the late 1890s, factory inspection is happening um, in New South Wales and Victoria. And there's a lot of interest in the working conditions of, say, Chinese um, furniture factories, for example, in Sydney and in Melbourne. And so kind of replacing that discourse around gambling, which dissipates after the Royal Commission, that does dissipate, and a focus on um, labour conditions replaces it. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Hey. Silly question, but was gambling actually illegal at the time? Or? No, it wasn't illegal, no. And this is the problem. So, <laughs> um, it was illegal without a licence, okay? So, <laughs> this is where the police bribery comes in, right? So, the problem was that despite all this kind of rhetoric around kind of white women and white men kind of losing their life savings at the gambling table in, um, in, in New South Wales, um, you know, uh, quite a few of these establishments in the Rocks had licences. Right. And so what do you do when they've got licenses? And this, hence the accusations against the police, because that's a way around that. Well, the police shouldn't have given licenses. They're clearly being bribed. So you'll see in the report accusations that, you know, there's, there's one policeman that wears quite a lot of gold rings. He's, he walks around the rocks with all these gold rings. Right. He's a, a bit of a kind of like flamboyant character. And um, the accusation is that he was given those rings by Chinese, you know, gambling dens. He wasn't. He lost a couple of the rings gambling himself. Right, but he didn't actually get them as gifts. But there's this rumor that circulates that he was bribed, right? And the problem is they can't, you know, they can't prove this. Um, the other accusation that Henry Parks makes is that the gambling establishments are sending. He he makes some, you know, very large estimation. You know, I think it's like ten thousand pounds or some very kind of large sums back to China. So these working class men and women are giving their savings to these gambling dens, and they're just all they're doing is remitting, remitting the cash back to China. The commission establishes that that's absolutely not the case. <laughs> the money actually is going back into the community. Uh, it's not being sent back to China. It's just not, not with these gambling, gambling establishments anyway. Often what happens with the gambling is that a, set, a, a part of the profit is paid to a Chinese kind of mutual aid society. We call them secret societies. They weren't, they were kind of Chinese unions. And these Chinese unions would often help um, Chinese migrants from different villages get lawyers, get, go to hospital. They were kind of like mutual aid charities for migrants. So in fact, the earnings were going into helping the Chinese community, keeping them off you know, dependency or off the streets, right? So again, the commission does that corrective to Henry Parks' rhetoric, which I think is amazing and so interesting. All right, hope that answered your question a bit. Uh, then how about the opium? Thank you. Great question. I didn't get into that, but thank you. Great question. Great question. So Kuang Tart, who I mentioned before, I'm just going to go back to look at Kuang Tart a bit. Let's go. Here we go. Here's Kuang Tart. Kuang Tart is a passionate member of the Anti-Chinese Opium League. So by the late kind of 19th century, along with a movement called Temperance, which you guys might be aware of, you know, led by Methodists. These were my ancestors were Methodists. So Temperance being, you know, taking the pledge and not drinking alcohol. Um, there's a big movement within the overseas Chinese community, not just in Sydney, but actually California as well and Canada, against opium smoking, right? And again, you can see the class element here, right? So as with temperance, which is often middle-class do-gooders, like my ancestors, kind of telling working class people not to drink, right? Um, the, Kuang Tart is a member of kind of an upper-class Sydney Chinese merchant elite saying don't smoke opium usually a working class thing to do. So if you went to um, Retreat Street in Alexandria, for example, I might just go back to Retreat Street, Alexandria, and we'll get back there in a minute. Anyways, Retreat Street, I love this. Okay, here we go. So if you were here, you would have smelt, smelt a lot of opium. <laughs> this was where you went uh, if you wanted to kind of get opium in Sydney at the time. It was quite openly used. Um, I mean, opium is important because uh, for a lot of Chinese market gardeners, they have horrific back pain. You can imagine carrying around your vegetables all day. There's a lot of joint and back pain from that kind of labor, including the labor of market gardening pre-mechanization. So just even distributing the fertilizer across the vegetables, it was incredibly labor intensive and tiring. So often Chinese market gardeners had a lot of joint problems. So the opium was not just a leisure activity. It's actually about physical pain. So, you know, market gardeners are using it a lot, but the Chinese merchants don't need to because they're not working men. So again, this is part of the anger of the market gardeners. Like, you want to take away my Panadol, kind of, you know. So there is a, um, a big move against smoking opium. And some of the market gardeners from the Gaoya district read that as like, 
you know, taking away their autonomy. And they saw the Chinese merchants like Quang Tart as playing to the gallery of white people. Like you are just giving white people what they want. So there's, like I said, we forget that there are these interclass tensions within the community. But again, someone needs to write a PhD thesis on opium in Sydney, I think. <laughs> It'd be a great topic. Yeah. So the opium at that time is more like the mess are this type among the, I mean, truck drivers? That's a, wow, that's a great parallel. That's a great parallel. I mean, I must admit, I'm a labor historian. If you're someone that, you know, I'm very interested in labor rights and these kinds of things, and I feel they're forgotten in history. So I, you're drawing a parallel, what was your name, sorry? Uh, my name? Yeah. Chen Shu. Chen Shu, thank you. So Chen Shu, I think you're saying that there's a parallel between truck drivers today who often, you know, are reliant on stimulants to survive these you know, ridiculous journeys across the country, serving Woolworths and Coles, ridiculous demands in terms of how quickly they deliver goods. Um, we know that the transport union has drawn attention to this. Absolutely, there are parallels because, you know, the market gardeners had to travel quite long journeys into the city. They wa they're walking around all day with these heavy vegetables. Absolutely, opium was a way of relieving the pain. It wasn't just a fun thing to do. Um, having said that, you know, it's a very potent drug. <laughs> I'm not trying to defend opium use, but it definitely was um, approached, and this is across the overseas Chinese world, as a, pain, a form of pain relief. And that, that goes for plantation work on sugarcane plantations, that goes for, you know, work in, um, you know, various so-called coolie work in Singapore. Um, opium was definitely something that allowed um, Chinese men and women to work longer hours at that time, yeah. And about the opium, I have a... Um I once read some, uh, some document about why, I mean, the, the Australia, uh, I mean, oppose Chinese of opium. It's because it's much cheaper than English of uh, opium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's no tariff. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there's a wonderful guy called Amitav Ghosh who writes all about the opium trade, right? And so, yes, I mean, I mean I th we've, we've lost this world today. Um, but, you know, obviously back in the day, the different gradients of opium quality uh, were absolutely foundational to British wealth. So, you know, British wealth is not only built on slavery, um, it's also built via the British East India Company on opium from India. Yeah. Right? So we forget that, you know, so much of the wealth of the Empire, British Empire, that was used to colonise this country came from uh, particularly Indian opium. Right? Um, but obviously, you know, much of that Indian opium went through Hong Kong for packaging and distribution, leading to widespread addiction in Hong Kong and South China to opium. So ironically, in South China at this time, opium is a source of Chinese nationalism, you know, uh, leading up to the 1911 revolution, because it's seen as a tool of British oppression. The British have come in and given this drug and they've like, you know, oppressed our society with this opium. You know, and so, of course, Marx famously gives us, you know, the term opium to the masses. So opium is a really important symbol for, you know, Chinese resentment against British imperialism, just as it's a tool of Australian racism kind of in Sydney. So it's a really interesting contrast, I think. Thanks for asking the question. Um, very stupid question here. Uh, during the whole article, you said, uh, I mean, all around the, the rocks. And then why is no, I mean, no Chinese, I mean, I, any sign of Chinese mm, Great question. Yeah. I have a few theories. Uh, so if you do read some books in the rocks, there is mentions of, of Chinese migrants. But when um, Australian convict heritage was really being celebrated for the first time in the 70s and 80s in Australia, this is a country that, you know, for much of its history didn't embrace its convict past. And then, you know, by the 70s, um, it suddenly became, you know, I think legitimate for Australians to begin acknowledging their convict ancestors, right? The rocks is being regenerated at that time and the focus becomes on Sydney's convict history rather than its Chinese past, okay? So the need to celebrate convicts as kind of these working class heroes, which is a kind of a key pillar of Australian nationalism, quite an interesting, odd one, I think, um, really, if you think about it. Um, you know, uh, the need to kind of celebrate these working class men and women who are convicts was deemed more important at this time than acknowledging the Chinese history. And remember that Haymarket had then become quite a big part of Sydney's Chinese history. So it was sort of thought, okay, Haymarket, Sydney's Chinese Chinatown, the rocks is like where the convict heritage is. So that was, it's about tourism. The, 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 tour, tour, the focus in terms of tourism development divided between those two places. And the heritage of um, Sydney's first Chinatown was lost in the process. So Haymarket was Paddy's market fruit and vegetable market, so that was where it, it grew out of it. Was it that why Haymarket became a Chinese? It kind of came a bit late. It kind of came a bit late, Haymarket, because it was actually, 
There was The Rocks, and then there was a place called Wexford Street, which is in Surrey Hills. It's been demolished now. Uh, that was a Chinatown. So unlike Melbourne, which was, has always had kind of little Burke Street, was kind of stable, we didn't do that. I mean, actually, you know, the only reason why Haymarket became associated with Chinese migrants is they ran the fruit and veg industry, right? Mostly because they weren't allowed into other industries. The, the, the laws that I talked about, you know, um, made it very difficult if you weren't a naturalised citizen to get other professional work. And so the fruit and veg industry by the 1920s is very much dominated by, you know, Chinese migrants. Um, and I think that's why Haymarket becomes and Paddy's Markets become so associated with Chinese migrants. But, you know, it's, I think, more of a 1920s phenomenon. Whereas, you know, the real kind of old Chinatown is the Rocks and Wexford Street. Yeah. So can I see the Haymarket is more like a tourist attraction than a real Chinese, I mean, community? I'll add one thing to that. Um, you know, by the 30s, there is, a, and I would say this, um, the Kuomintang building, the Sydney KMT. So the Kuomintang is the party that Sun Yat-sen, you know, um, establishes in China after you know, the 1911 revolution, which overthrows the Qing Empire. Um, so the KMT have an important building in, in Sydney's Chinatown, in Haymarket. So politically, for the history of Chinese politics, particularly um, uh, the, the Kuomintang, the Re Republican era politics, but also um, what's called the Chinese Youth League, which is a communist organisation, that forms um, in the 30s in Chinatown, um, Haymarket's vital. So there is actually a really interesting kind of 1930s and 40s political history of um, Haymarket that's very Chinese. But yes, this idea that Haymarket's always been Sydney's Chinatown is a tourist invention for sure, yes. I think we're out of time today for the formal part of the talk, but um, please stay and take a look at the item if you wish. And uh, please join me in thanking Sophie once again for <laughs>